Hi, I'm Matt Chandler here, pastor of the Village Church. Just want to thank you for streaming uh, this sermon uh, on your device. Uh, I, I wanted to, just before we get going here, uh, just lay before you a deep conviction we have that this video sermon uh, that we've prayed really stirs up your affections for Jesus and shapes you and molds you into the image uh, of the Son um, would just be supplemental to your relationship with the Lord and in no way would replace the church you should be plugged into or the pastor that God has put over your life to shepherd and care for your soul. And so please uh, enjoy the next hour or so uh, of this message. We have prayed that God would use it in a profound way in your life. Blessings. talking about the sinfulness of women. Just not dangerous at all, is it? If you have your Bibles, let's go. Uh, Genesis chapter three, that'll be our primary text. In fact, it'll be uh, in that text that we kind of land and, and dig, and then there's one verse in particular we'll kind of pick apart. And so uh, if you're a guest with us this morning, don't have a Bible with you, my encouragement would be that you uh, look under your seat or around you. There should be a hardback black one uh, somewhere. If you don't own one, that's our gift to you. Just really important that you see I'm not making anything up here, that there's some things that are rooted uh, in history and rooted in uh, the Bible, and that, that really, by and large, the world would agree with whether they were Christians or not. So in the book of Romans, one of the things we see um, is that Paul, the Apostle Paul, a guy who hated Jesus uh, and then actually turned into one of the greatest missionaries of the Christian faith, he was actually a terrorist against the Christian faith, killing Christians when he uh, became one uh, himself. Uh, he, he wrote that one of the interesting things about those who don't believe in Jesus is that oftentimes they'll live or desire to live like Jesus would have them live without knowing that's actually what they were doing. Uh, and so one of the things we've done is we've gotten into this series. Now we're, uh, in, we're deep into the series now that we've called Beautiful Design. And what we're talking about is manhood and womanhood and what that actually is and how that actually works. And so we've said some things that are important as we dive into today, lest we forget things that have already been said. Don't have time to do an expansive overview, but what we have set up until this point is that men and women were created by God in the image of God and hold a, a higher place in creation than any Anything else in the creative order so that we as man and woman are far more valuable than say our dog or our cat or some other species of animal out there that doesn't give us permission to be cruel doesn't give us permission to be brutal but we are far more valuable and we know this intrinsically okay we we just know this intrinsically and then we got into the fact that being male does not make one a man and being female does not make one a woman again the, the law, the unchristian law, would say this is true. Uh, my son is eight. He cannot buy daddy a 20-year bottle of Pappy Wham Winkle for Christmas. He can't do it. You know why? Because he's eight and because that stuff's impossible to find. Right? So this is, like they would say that my eight-year-old son is a boy, not a man. He can't buy a gun. He cannot vote. He can't buy his daddy a nice bottle of bourbon. He can't do it because he's a boy and not a a man. You tracking? Now, I have a five-year-old daughter. No one's going to argue that she's a woman regardless of their religiosity. They can be completely secular. No one's going to look at my five-year-old and go, woman. They're going to say she's a girl. So she is biologically female. My son is biologically male, but he is not a man and she is not a woman. There is something other than that is attached to them, a type of behavior, a way of living that biblically would lead to them being man or woman. And without those pieces, then little boys just grow into being little boys in bigger, more mature bodies. And little girls grow into just being little girls in bigger, more developed bodies. They still act like children act. 
And so we started to kind of define manhood biblically and womanhood biblically. And so here's what we said. We said that the man uh, was given by God what we called headship. And this is the unique leadership of the man in organizing or building out in ordering for human flourishing. And we said you just can't argue with that definition because sociologists, uh, those who study uh, economics, Everyone would say where men are present, where they are serving, loving, and kind, everything flourishes. The home flourishes, the economy flourishes, cities flourish. Where men are men, things go well. And where men refuse to enter in the space God created for them to walk into, things just don't work well. You get into the poorest neighborhoods imaginable. Let me tell you what you'll see. Fatherlessness and women who have been consumed and not honored or loved. That's what you're going to find. Uh, women have been used as playthings rather than as um, those made in the image of God. And so we said that's the role of the man. And then we talked about how man struggles, very much like we'll do today with women. More on that here in a second. And then here's how we define the role of women last week. A woman is, according to the book of Genesis, a helper fit for the man. And so we called it a helpmate, and here's how we defined it. A helpmate is a woman who serves God by helping the man in the work of establishing order for human flourishing. And, and we immediately needed to do some work around that definition so that we could understand it most fully. Um, God, most often in the Old Testament scriptures, is our helper, is our helpmate. And so the woman being called a helper for the man is not and does not mean she is inherently inferior. Actually, God being the helper has elevated the role of helpmate to a position of honor. And what we said a helper does is a helper serves the one who holds the primary responsibility. And so if you are helping me, it's my responsibility and I am too weak to get it done. So I need your help. So I am unable, either I don't have the bandwidth, I don't have the ability, I'm missing some pieces. And so I need your help because I cannot get it done. It does not mean that that you are weak for having to help me. It means that I am weak and therefore need your help. This is what we see happening when God looks at the man and says, it's not good for man to be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. And then we talked about that little phrase, fit for him, uh, about the reality that men and women were built out as complementarian, that we need each other, that, that we're not opposed to one another, but, but actually uh, the strengths of one uh, help the weaknesses of the other. And where this happens, where men exercise biblical headship, where they are sacrificially loving, they are creating environments that honor and, and uplift the name of Jesus Christ, and they're establishing a place where the word of God is seen and honored, and we understand God as he has revealed himself, and where they provide for where that happens and where women come underneath that, that the idea of male headship, that idea might be attacked as a philosophy, but if they came into our homes, our wives would not want to be freed from anything. And, and so really, men, here, here's a great way to gauge how you're serving, loving, and practicing your headship. If the most secularized feminist in the world showed up in your home and began to kind of coach your wife towards freedom and liberation from your tyranny, uh, our wives should be so well cared for, so nourished, so, um, so, so sewed into and loved that they would like, what you're describing is actually tyranny. I, I love where I am. Uh, I am honored. I am encouraged. My man sacrifices so that I might grow in my gifts. He will oftentimes lay down his own desires in order to serve me more. My husband goes to bed tired at night. He pours into our children. He encourages me. All that comes out of his mouth, sands a couple of little times uh, here and there, is him building me up in love. So, man, here's a, here's a good opportunity that if you're like, well, gosh, I don't think she would say that at all, then, man, I, I think on the way home, you, you should probably repent and confess before the Lord to your wife. Now, quit asking me about you, though. We've already covered you. We're here to talk about the ladies. <laughs> all right, so what we said about men is that because the sinfulness of the world has fractured this complementarian beauty that since it's fractured, then men are, instead of filling the space like God intended them to fill, they're prone to selfish passivity or selfish aggression. 
All right? And so men are, are prone to do that. They tend to be selfishly passive or selfishly aggressive. They're overbearing and dominating, or they are meek and refuse to engage. And, and any sin you could list to me that a man operates in can fit in one of those buckets. Right? You want to talk pornography? That, yeah, that's selfish aggression. Uh, you want to talk about domineering? That's selfish uh, aggression. You want to talk about abuse and violence? That's selfish uh, aggression. You, you want to talk about um, won't lead, won't engage, won't love? That's selfish passivity, right? They, all the sins of men can be found in one of these two buckets. And so what I want to do today, fearlessly, mind you, is lay before you the two buckets that women most often find their sins filling. And here are the two buckets, all right? Here's that, and we're gonna just uh, tease them apart. The, the first bucket where we will find most of the sins of women is the bucket of comparison. The second bucket that we will find most of the sins of women would be called perfectionism. And so as men are prone to selfish passivity and selfish aggression, women are prone to the disordered desires of comparison and perfectionism, and both of those lead to a type of darkness and destruction as to erode the very feminine soul so that women will carry with them under the weight of comparison and perfectionism the stench of death, just like men carrying and walking in selfish passivity and selfish aggression will reek of death. So with that said, our help here is found in um, Genesis 3, starting in verse 1. You can read that, but I want to just concentrate on verse 16. So this is the fall. It begins to break down. Um, here is the curse given to the woman. Look at verse 16 with me. To the woman, he said, God said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children, and your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. So two things to consider in this text, just as we break it down, that God is laying on the woman in the same text that he lays some things on the man, not in 16, but in 17 through 19. So uh, on this, he starts with this that I will surely increase, multiply your pain in childbearing. Now, uh, I've been in that room three times now. All three times, I have found in my heart a swelling up of gratitude and gladness that I am a man. <laughs> I mean, I've been in there. It, it, there's nothing about that makes me go, I'd like to experience that. In fact, my wife, who's so awesome and godly, she was sweating and snarling and I don't know, something demonic maybe. I was confused and frightened. Um, her hair had gotten in her face and was stuck to the sweat on her face. So I thought as a loving husband, let me just get that out of her face and tuck it behind her ear. And, and so I went, put my finger and tucked it about. And I said, hey, boo, can I get you anything? To which my loving wife responded, you can get out of my face. <laughs> now, here's what happened. I didn't know if I was actually supposed to do that. Like, if I got out of her face, is this going to get worse? Should I stay? Get ice chips? What am I? Like, I'm a confident man and was so confused at what exactly I was supposed to do in that moment. Am I supposed to enter? Am I supposed to get out of her face? I don't know what to do. So I got out of her face because I thought, at least I would have, baby, I'm just trying to do what you told me to do. I've seen the pain of childbirth. And although when the baby shows up, it's awesome, the pain of childbirth is brutal. And it is a reminder, according to the scriptures, that the world is broken and there is a longing for something more. And all three of our children, my wife got to that place where she's like, get this kid out of me, I don't care. Just get the kid out. And then here this unbelievable thing happens. There's sweat and tears and pain and egg. And then the nurse grabs him, you know, scrubs him down, puts him on my wife's. And then all that pain just kind of vanishes. And as she holds that baby, the fact that this has come, that this is born, that that pain has now given birth to life, makes the pain uh, almost uh, apparently worth it because they do it again, many of them. <laughs> Right? And there's some beautiful, you want to talk beautiful design. I mean, God's actually hormonally wired them. You know, breastfeeding makes them forget. How awesome is that? <laughs> like as they breastfeed, the body releases a hormone that makes them forget the pain of childbirth, which is why the human race is still here, right? That and the epidural. So, uh, and I know Denton right now is like epidural center. All right. But by and large, that, that's why. 
And so what's happening in this verse as the pain of childbirth is increasing is the same thing that happens in verse 17 through 19 with the man where the toil and sweat of man will now bring about pain, where he's going to work, where the weight put on his shoulders to lead and love and self-sacrifice and protect feels like an overwhelming burden on the man, so much so that he has a tendency to punt on that responsibility or to lord in aggression over others with his physical stature. So it's not that women have been cursed with pain and men have not. It is this reality. When sin entered into the cosmos, it brought pain and death to us all. And it brought pain and death right into the middle of our distinctive identities. So for the man, pain and death has entered. Toil, strife, work, hard. For the woman, pain in childbirth and having to deal with a man. You should have said amen there, not giggled, but whatever. <laughs> now, in this, you've got an immense amount of brokenness, but here's something that I want us to pay attention as this verse goes on. Not only has sin distorted the external aspects of womanhood, but sin has infected the very heart and hope of womanhood as well. Uh, look at the end of verse 16 with me. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. So not, not only will I greatly increase the pain in childbearing, but I will also disorder desire. So that now that sin has entered the cosmos, disordered desires now rule the feminine heart. And if we're honest, disordered desires rule all hearts. It will play itself out in specific ways with the female. Now, historically, when this text is taught, what is taught out of this text, I believe correctly is that women will oftentimes try to usurp the authority of husbands. They will usurp the authority of the man. They will refuse to submit to a type of headship, even when that headship is for the woman's edification, growth, encouragement, and flourishing in the Lord. So it's been taught that way. That is a right way to interpret this text. I just think it's a symptom and not the full-on meaning of the text. Let me explain why I would land there. Your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you actually starts to explain the twisted, disordered desires of both the male and female heart that lead to a breakdown in the type of complementarity that our hearts are so hungered for. Jesus' own brother James taught us about this in James 1, 14 through 15 when he said this. And, and by the way, for free, uh, how do you convince your brother that you're the son of God? I mean, I got siblings. I don't know what I could do to convince them that I'm the son of God, except maybe come back from the dead. But uh, not, no, no time for that this week. Um, but each, this is James 1, 14 through 15. But each person is tempted when he, she, is lured and enticed by his own desire, or I would say disordered desires. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Are, are you tracking with the flow of things here? So desire now has been disordered. So you can desire good things, but if you elevate those desires beyond where they were supposed to be, the desire becomes disordered and you become enslaved to the desire. James will later on um, in chapter four um, explain it in a real kind of on the ground concrete way. Here it goes, verse one of chapter four. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? So in your home, what causes fights and quarrels? In your church, what causes fights and quarrels? At, in your relationships, at your workplaces, what is the root behind fighting and quarrels? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? So you desire and you do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. Again, it's our desires, disordered desires, many times desires for good things that have become ultimate things leading us into sin. We desire and we have to have blank, whatever it is, so bad that if we don't get it, we'll do what we ought not to do. We'll fight and quarrel and murder to get this disordered desire even if it's a good thing. So let me give you uh, just an easy example. I think an easy example. It's not a bad desire to make a good living. That's not a bad desire. All right? In fact, I've tried to encourage you to be hard workers, to climb the, the corporate ladder. I'd rather you be the CFOs and CEOs in the business world, but do so in such a way that doesn't trample over your family to get there and doesn't um, punt on righteousness to get there. And if that's the only way up the ladder, then you're climbing a two-foot ladder. 
And, and so ultimately, it's a good desire to make a great living. When that desire becomes ultimate and not just a good desire, then all of a sudden, you are willing to sacrifice your family. You are, because you've disordered that desire. It's a good thing to desire a, a good living. It's a bad thing for your ultimate desire to have money, because then your family is going to move down the ladder. Your own integrity will move down the ladder, because what is ultimate to you will control you. And so we need to make sure our desires aren't disordered or, or where they are, we have to be aware. Now, in verse 16, what it's specifically talking about is Eve's desire for Adam. He's talking about this marriage, and I'll push it farther than that. He's talking about um, how women will view men, how men will treat women, how women will respond to how men treat women. You there? Okay. So let, let me just read this, and, and then I'll show you kind of this cycle that we're all in, that we need help in, and then we'll get into we'll get into um, comparison and we'll get into perfectionism. Most women set up men as idols and look to them to provide emotionally, spiritually, and physically what only God can provide. Apart from Christ, men oppress women in return. Hence, the modern coping mechanisms of independent self-sufficiency and control for dealing with that male oppression. Do you see how it's a, it's a circle? So women will want a man. This is every movie, every romantic comedy you have ever seen right here in this text. All right, this is, I, I need a man to satisfy me. I need a man to fill me. I need a man to complete. I need a man to complete me, right? Jerry Maguire, this is fault, inner stars. This is, that's all of it. I, I need someone to help me. Men, because they are sinful, in turn, oppress women. And then women, because of that oppression, began to build kind of veneer strength that would then lean on independence. I don't need no man. Lean into control, lean into a self-sufficiency, a skepticism and a hatred towards men. Many times rightfully earned. Many times rightfully earned. But here's the reality. Outside of Genesis 3, when any desire, be it a desire for a man or a woman, a desire for a job, a desire for comfort or an achievement is elevated higher than it should be, then that person or that thing that we are desiring will rule over us. Any desire that we demand and make ultimate actually ends up controlling and ruling us. So hear me, what is your ultimate? Whatever it is, it is ruling you. So with that said, ladies, let's talk about, by and large, the hurdles that are yours and not necessarily men's. So there will be men that can fall into these buckets primarily, and I'm gonna use, uh, like I did with men, I wanna use secular uh, authors because like Paul tells us in Romans, the world agrees with us, they just don't know they're agreeing with the Bible. That's what I love it. They're like, this is true. Well, that's in the Bible. Dang it, right? I like that. <laughs> so um, here we go, comparison. When I'm talking about comparison, let me define it. Comparison is the disordered desire for approval and validation. Um, this is a quote from Julia Offelin. I'm going to quote her three times in a, in a row here from an article in The Telegraph, which is a newspaper in the UK. This is an article entitled, Why Do Girls Check Out Other Girls? Like it or not, we're all guilty of it. Be it the inconspicuous glance at the girl browsing the same clothes shop window as you or the rather more blatant stares at the girl sitting opposite on the tube, subway, no Dallas equivalent. We just can't seem to help ourselves. And a recent study has confirmed it. Women spend more time checking each other out than they do the opposite sex. According to Dr. Caroline Walters, a body image and women's sexuality specialist, it's not just other women's clothes we are checking out either. It's practically every aspect of another woman's appearance, from hairstyle to tan, shape, size, even body hair and fat distribution. Whatever we deem to be most important to ourselves, we check out in other women. So that a woman then becomes enslaved by comparing intellects, comparing beauty, body composition, style, and fashion. In fact, here's another quote from the article. The article is going to argue that women actually dress for other women. They don't dress for men at all. Here's the quote. Most women will agree that when we look in the mirror, we don't ask ourselves what he sees in us. We ask what? What she sees. So that when girls get all dressed up for the club, you know, have you ever wondered why? Why would you wear four-inch heels out dancing? You want to know why? Because it makes them an inch taller than the other girls. 
Like, I, this is new to me. It's like, it's confused me. It's disoriented me. Like, Lauren was dressing up the other night. I was like, who are you dressing up for? <laughs> you. Uh-uh-uh. It's uh, uh. not what Julie Offelin says. <laughs> right? And so it's this comparison where women will use their bodies to get the upper hand. They will flaunt what culture has called their strengths, not history, but culture has called their strengths, because by and large, throughout human history, curvier women have been viewed curlier, pastier women have been viewed as beautiful. It is a modern idea that six-pack abs make one feminine. And throughout human history, history behind us would say, eat something, girl. Eat something. We compare beauty, body, style, fashion. God help us, we're comparing parenting. I just call this the mommy wars. It's, you, let me tell you who loses in the mommy wars. You ready? Your children do. Yes. Like this has gotten absurd. I lo- I'm with you, sister. I wish they, so uh, this is what ends up happening. All right. Um, moms will get together and they'll start talking about their kids. And it's normal at first until one of them's like, well, I sent um, little Cynthia to um, marine biology camp and she uh, was studying and learning about uh, crustaceans. And, and what we read is that by going to that marine biology camp, she is going to be in line for scholarships. And you're just like, my kid's an idiot, all right? He was at the, she was at the campfire making s'mores and made a little beaded necklace. God knows now she's never getting into college. And now we're competing in this game of comparison. We're like, I got to get my kid ready. And that's why some of you are spending $5,000 flying some dude in from Brazil to train your three-year-old in soccer. It's crazy. They're not getting scholarships. And some of you are like, mine is three goals yesterday. <laughs> right? This is cult-like. It's absurd. And it's our children who are losing because there's no more free thought. Go have fun. Everything's structured and organized. There is no exploration. Pick your spurt early. I'm three. Pick your sport. You got to pick one. You can't play them. If you play all of them, you're not gonna be good at any of them. Pick your one. We're going to get you the best trait. Here's creatine monohydrate in your bottle. It's insane. P90X for two-year-olds. All right, crawl, 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 crawl. Nice. It's insane. This is mommy wars. This is comparison. I've got to be a good mom. I've got to be a better mom. It's comparison. Comparing marriages. Uh, Oh, man, he pursues her. I wish my husband pursued me that way. Females are partly programmed to do it, explains Kareen Sweet, a relationship psychotherapist and author of Change Your Life with CBT, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. Here, they're not evangelical, not believing the Bible. That's what I'm saying. They agree with us. They just don't know they agree with us. Firstly, it is only natural to compare yourself as it gives you a point of reference, which can be reassuring. However, the harsh reality is that it's a cattle market out there and the commodity is male attention. Women are checking out the competition and identifying who the alpha female in the pack is. Women subconsciously put themselves in a hierarchy. Like here's what blew my, like I know dudes do that. I just didn't know women did it too. So they will find the best mom and they'll just get around her. They will find the most beautiful woman and they'll just get around her so that they can reap the spoils of the alpha female. I didn't even know there was an alpha female. So the most beautiful, most talented women are are surrounded uh, by beautiful, talented women who want some of the beautiful talent of that woman to fall on them. And I knew, I always knew this was a male issue. I just didn't know that the girls were in it. So welcome, guys. Now, at the end of the day, comparison is competition. And what you're comparing and competing for is identity. You want to have an identity. It's a desire for approval and acceptance and validation. It is, ladies, an identity gone bad. It is a veneer, faux identity that's placated around a false strength and a false I've got it all together that has us constantly comparing, constantly trying to better ourselves, not based on any universal biblical standard, but actually by the standards of our current age, we've got to be that, we've got to accomplish this, and it's all, most of it, way out of step with how humans have functioned for thousands and thousands of years. 
and it leads to dark, dark, dark places. See, when you put forth a veneer, an image of yourself that is untrue just to keep up, when you're trying to be in, to get the guy, to get the job, then, and, and God, listen, if social media has destroyed anything, it has destroyed uh, our ladies, bless y'all's heart. There's this faux image of what you're supposed to look like. And then what's the worst possible thing you could do with people who struggle with comparison? Give every one of them a phone with a camera in it. Like, no, no woman takes a picture of herself at six in the morning with clear cell dried on that zit on her face. <laughs> Living large, women crush Wednesday. Like, nobody does that. No, all dolled up features like they want them, whatever could be strength or even made to look like a strength, just sitting around. <laughs> and, and what is that? It, it's a veneer. And, and here's the problem with veneer. An untrue image of one's self will always lead to discontentment and insecurity. Always. A veneer, which is why I plead with you all the time here at the village, just be honest about where you are. You don't have to fake it. If you're struggling with doubt, then just say it. If you've got addiction, then just say it. We're not afraid of your brokenness. We are. If anything, feel at home in your mental health. Feel at home in your addiction. Let's journey together towards health and healing. We've got no shot at it if you're not willing to be honest. This veneer madness has to stop because where it exists, there is discontentment and insecurity. That works itself out in fantasizing fantasizing about a different color of hair or skin, a different size waist or chest, a different husband or boyfriend, which will always lead then, see, we're spiraling out of control now, which will always lead to coveting and jealousy. And, and here's what's interesting about jealousy and coveting, specifically as females. Um, males will most often use their size and strength to intimidate. Um, and so when men are insecure, have you ever heard little man syndrome? So when men are insecure, they're going to handle that physically, all right? Say something to me. I wish you would, right? That's what happens to men. Now, women um, don't tend to operate like that. They actually uh, operate with words. And, and women can either, with their words, interject a type of fertilizer into human fur flourishing that makes everything grow, or they can, like some cruel ninja assassin, burn it all to the ground, like women with their words and attitudes can brutalize the human race. And I'll say it, go ahead and email me. Women are cruel. And it starts early. If you've got daughters and you've watched your daughter try to engage with other daughters, something's wrong there, man. It's like, I mean, that's scary stuff. So I remember when Audrey was three years old, we were out at the community pool. There's a little kiddie pool there. You know, the one's about two feet deep, about 30 degrees warmer and everything else for some reason. And, and uh, Audrey was heading there. There were three other girls playing with each other. I mean, I can just see that train wreck coming. There's never in the history of the world been three little girls who know each other playing where a fourth outsider comes in where there's like, hey, would you like one of our toys? Never ends that way. Uh, and so they huddle up. They just keep, they'll ignore. Uh, Audrey's confident. She's trying to get in there. Doesn't matter. All right, so then she comes back to me. They don't really want to play with me, Dad. And so my flesh is incited. Uh, I just want to say like, hey, don't worry. Look, she's not even cute at three. She got no, there's no trajectory there <laughs> in, in 15 more years. All right, I don't, you're going to be the alpha female. And she'll be like, can I hang out with you? And then you close the door on her face. <laughs> and that was in my flesh. I didn't say that. All right, I'm a better dad than that. But that was there. That was there. Oh, you guys are so holy. <laughs> and, and so instead, I just said, hey, Daddy, Daddy remembers what it's like uh, to be cut out, to not be accepted. I'm sorry, boo. This will be a part of life. So it's not about you. It's about them. And then we went home. And, and really, you see women with their words brutalizing each other, emasculating men, gossiping, slandering. Are you saying men don't? No, I'm not. I'm saying that women are far more varsity at it than men are. <laughs> and, and I'm going to quote the seculars to prove my point. All right. Now, even the Bible will say this is a real issue specifically for how women brutalize men with their words. So men can intimidate and use size. Women will most often use their words. Listen to what God has to say about this. Proverbs 19, 13. This is in the Bible, mind you. A foolish son is ruined to his father and a wife's quarreling is a continual dripping of rain. Waterboarding. Right, You live with a quarrelsome wife, might as well put a sheet over your face and then just pour water on you forever. 
Like God's saying that, right? You live in the house with a contemptuous, emasculating woman who is an expert on your weaknesses and delights in cutting you with her words. That's like a dripping faucet. And then it gets worse. Proverbs 21, 9. It is better to live in a corner of the housetop than in a house shared with a quarrelsome wife. It's like, Lord's like, say, man, I see what's happening. Get up on the roof, man. Get up on the roof. It's raining. You'll be all right. Get up on the roof. What about lightning? If you're lucky, I'll hit you. All right, get up there. All right? So you've got God saying, better to live on your roof than in the house with a woman who's constantly going to jab at you, poke at you, all right, emasculate you, question you, is an expert with her words and how to wound you. I said last week that wives can wound their husband in ways that no one else can. Because they are most known by their wives, even if they're only partially known. And then the last one, this is the one I quoted last week, Proverbs 21, 19. It is better to live in a desert land than with a quarrelsome and fretful woman. I don't know what you think of when you think of desert. Don't think beach. This is desert, like there's no water, there's no vegetation. The animals there are weird and barely survive. They're small. <laughs> and God just said, Sam, get your stuff. <laughs> Head out to the desert. It's going to be nasty. Probably going to die out there. And it's better than where you are. <laughs> right? This idea of being a quarrelsome, fretful woman. This idea of tearing down with your words. So, so let me just say two things here. Um, one, God hates gossip and slander. He hates it. He will not have it in his church, not even disguised as prayer requests. He hates it. And, and by the way, ladies, let's chat for a second. Like, who the heck do you think you are that you're standing in a position in which you could gossip or slander anyone? Like, how highly do you view yourself or how insecure are you that you would judge others and where they are? Aren't we all where we are by the grace of God? Like, what have you done that would put you in a position in which you could judge another woman? Are you so perfect in how you're living your life? Is your life so pretty that you literally have the right to sit and judge other women, other men? Like, who do you think you are? What sort of pre-Madonna, self-absorbed, insecure woman are you that you would stand in that spot and cast judgment on others? It's wicked. It's deplorable. Who in the world do you think you are? Like, like your sin doesn't reek of death. There are no perfect people. It's what creates humility in us. And it's only the insecure and those who are, lack self-awareness that dare venture into the worlds of gossip and slander. Now, wives with husbands, I would never encourage you to be marshmallows that just get run over. But hear me. There is a way to engage your husband that is encouraging and life-giving, and then there's a way to engage him that will incite his flesh and will not go well. So here's an example from our home. October was easily the busiest month of my year. Traveled a bunch, had a lot to do for A29, uh, had a lot to do here. Uh, not to mention the sermon series, which requires, because I'm trying to pull from a lot of secular sources, um, some, some extra study time. And um, Lauren came to me um, just a couple of weeks ago and just said, hey, um, can I chat for you, with you for a second? And it was the right time. Kids are down. Everything got quiet. And she said, I know there's been a crazy month for you. I know San Diego. And then you got the national conference coming up and you've got all these things in the air. And I've just felt um, in the midst of your busyness that we're a bit disjointed as a family, like I can feel with the kids and in my own heart, just this desire to sit down and, and open up the Bible and pray. And I know you've been busy, but is there something I can do to help us get to that place? Like, do I start, if I started dinner earlier, if we got the kids down earlier, if we got the kids done with showers and baths earlier, do you think we could sit down and, and make that happen? Now, do you see what's happening there? She's leaning on me, she's correcting me, and she's awesome at it. She didn't go, hey, Matt, why do you hate our family and not want to make us disciples? <laughs> why are you not practicing the very thing you're preaching to the men at the village, Mr. Self-Sacrificing Love, right? She didn't do that. You know why? It would have incited my flesh. Now, I'm mature enough not to scream at her, but I can tell you what I would start noticing, all her weaknesses. And, and I would start, I, I would have to really press into the Lord because I'd be 
freaking aggravated. <laughs> as hard as I'm working, as much as I'm pouring in, you and bring that up to me, right? But the way she went about it made me do this. Oh, man. Yeah, boo, why don't, we, why don't we try to start dinner a little bit earlier? I'll help you get the kids showered. I know the one that's gonna be the fight, so here's the threat that I think we should bring. I think we should open up the countdown on the iPhone and go, you've got 15 minutes to get in the shower and get out, come into this in your pajamas, or all that you own is gone, start. <laughs> Dad, I thought, you, I thought you, hey, you can say anything you wanna say to me, all right, but that's just, that's a minute, that's a minute, let me go get my little pricer gun for all your stuff. And then we got to sit down and do it. And she engaged me and corrected me and encouraged me in a way that did not emasculate me. I already know where I'm weak. I already know where, where I'm dropping the ball. I feel it. So to approach me with grace and compassion leads to greater fruitfulness. To pour on in a hard season incites my flesh. You'll find that almost all men are built this way. But it's not just comparison, this desire, disordered desire for approval and validation, but it's also perfectionism. This is the disordered desire for righteousness and perfection apart from Christ. Here, here we go. This is from uh, an article in The Atlantic called Closing the Confidence Gap. I love the first sentence. Underqualified and underprepared men don't think twice about leaning in, about getting into opportunity. So uh, a man is underqualified, he is underprepared, but he wants a shot at it. All right, all the empirical data is I'm gonna break this and, and sink the company, but I deserve a shot. That's men. And yet, overqualified and overprepared, two women still hold back. Women feel confident only when they are perfect or practically perfect. Study after study has shown that it, perfectionism, is largely a female issue, one that extends through women's entire lives. We don't answer questions until we are totally sure of the answer. We don't submit a report until we've edited it ad nauseum, and we don't sign up for that triathlon unless we know that we are faster and fitter than is required. We fixate on performance at home, at school, at work, at yoga class, even on vacation. We obsess as mothers, as wives, as sisters, as friends, as cooks, as athletes. So really, there, there's this interesting thing here, and this is according to this article. And these are not Christian women writing this article that perfectionism is a female sport, that men don't do it. Like men can be completely incompetent and they still want a shot at it. They are not paralyzed by their incompetence. They're just not. Give me a go. You can't read. Hand me the book. I mean, they're just, that's not how they work. Where women put a weight on their shoulders that's impossible to bear. I have to be a perfect student. I have to be perfect at work. I have to be a perfect wife. I have to be a perfect friend. I have to be a perfect. And where perfection is not attained, they are paralyzed. It works itself out in their relationships. When perfection is your goal, any type of conflict is very difficult. So you will rarely, if ever, stand on what you believe to be true. You will be shaped by those around you because in your quest for perfection, you will have no conscience. You will absorb the conscience and conviction of others. Not to mention, and here we can do this again, um, mommy guilt. Again, in this environment where raising children has become a competitive sport, not only is comparison a major issue that harms the children, but then the feeling of moms to be perfect. Like, like I can tell you this, there was no organic Cheerios when I was a kid. We hadn't discovered the tree that those things grew on yet. We just ate chips and, and drank Coke and stayed up later than we should and everybody spanked us and <laughs> it was a different world. But, but now, under this weight of perfection, I'll tell you what's happened. There's a cultural idea that's bought into, by and large, um, that, that is called psychological determinism. And, and what that means is parents believe that the children that they have are a blank slate and they can turn them in by their parenting techniques to whatever they want to turn them into. And so I can practice these parental techniques and I can make my kids stay away from drugs and I can make my kids stay away from alcohol. I can make my kids stay a virgin until the appropriate age. That's the secular world. All right, it's called psychological determinism. In fact, there was a guy in the 50s that said if you gave me 100 children, I could turn them into whatever I wanted to from day one. You gave them to me as newborn infants. I could make them doctors. I could make them professional athletes. I could make them psychologists. I could make them whatever I wanted to make them. That's psychological determinism. 
Now, what we've done as Christians is we've taken the same broken, weak idea, we've added a Bible verse to it, and we've inherited it. All right, we have taken, uh, train up a child in the way they should go, and even when they are old, they will not depart from it, and we have said, I can make my kid godly. Look at me, and that's absurd. Let me try to free you from this. The, the sentence um, that is crazy is this. Christian parenting techniques produce godly children. This is categorically false. Categorically false. Now, there is a responsibility as Christian parents to gather kindling around the souls of our children. We want to read the Bible in my home. We want to let our children watch us do ministry my children have come to the hospital with me to pray for others. They have gone to funerals to sit and, and help me just be a presence with the family. They have uh, seen us invite people into our home that reek of smoke and alcohol. They have watched us long sufferingly walk with men and women in the hopes that they might trust and believe in the name of Jesus. We have had men and women in our homes who are confessing homosexuals. We've had men and women in our home that have actively battled with addiction. And we're letting our children watch us love and serve and encourage these men and women, invite them into our lives. I climb in bed with them every night. We pray together as a family. Sometimes I get out of rhythm with that. And Mama is quick to encourage me in the Lord. I talk with them often about Jesus, about what they're thinking about the Lord. My 11-year-old is showing a ton of fruit as a believer, maybe. She's 11, all she knows is us. Let's just wait and see how the Lord takes root in her life. And I've learned it's never really over. I have found parents, they're still worried about their 30-year-olds and, and their faith, and, and, their, and so I'm, I'm learning it's not ever over, which is kind of a bummer. And she's... Showing fruit now, but, but I don't know. I can't make her believe. I can't make my son believe. I can't make my daughter believe. This makes me incredibly desperate. And it creates and should create, ladies, in you a type of humility when it comes to parenting. You're not going to be perfect. Look at me. You're going to snap at your kids. All right, breathe. You're going to snap at them. That's not going to make them serial killers. Right? You're going to lose patience. That doesn't mean you've skewed them forever. What we do is we confess our sins. We seek forgiveness. We acknowledge where we failed. And we trust that perfection has been given to us and that we don't possess it ourselves. Now, this perfectionism, just to be frank is brutalized women. Let me give you one more quote from Lynn Hirschberg. She's the um, managing editor of W Magazine, and she's also pretty big in Hollywood as a casting agent. Here's what she says. I have an iron will, and all of my will has always been set to conquer some horrible feeling of inadequacy. I push past one spell of it and discover myself as a special human being, and then I get another stage, and I think I'm mediocre and uninteresting again and again, my drive in life is from this horrible fear of being mediocre, and that's what's always pushing me, because even though I've become somebody, I still have to prove that I am somebody. My struggle has never ended, and it probably never will. See, this is perfectionism. I can't be mediocre. I can't, I've got to be somebody, and even when I become somebody, I've got to continue to prove that I am somebody. This is enslaving, and this is why, listen to me, ladies, that women are twice as likely to commit suicide as men are. This is why women by far wrestle with anxiety and depression more than men do. This is why, by and large, it is women who are overwhelmed with body image issues. 85 to 95% of people who suffer from eating disorders are females. On a recent college campus, it was revealed that 83% of those interviewed were dieting. 50% of those were of normal weight. What is that? That's perfectionism that enslaves. It leads to women being overwhelmed because how could you ever be happy if everything has to be perfect? How could you ever rest? How could you ever feel at peace? How could you ever see yourself as lovely if perfection is the standard? God, every holiday, 
every outing, every vacation, every interaction with your children, every day of your life, the oppressive, brutal weight of perfection on your back. Ladies, stop. You're not perfect. Breathe. No one is. And here's what's crazy. You, you don't have to be a perfect wife to be a great wife. You don't have to be a perfect mom to be a great mom. Well, where's that line? That line is confession, repentance, and getting back up and staying moving. That we take on the perfection made available to us in Jesus Christ. His righteousness, not my righteousness, not a false veneer righteousness of my own, not my strength, his strength. Not my perfection, his perfection. We rest in that. And then we walk as best we can every day where we fall short and snap at our husband. That's happening. Where we lose patience with our kids. That's happening, right? Right? Where we find ourselves gossiping, where we find ourselves hurting ourselves because we lack perfection, punishing ourselves. It, it is women who self-mutilate, not men. And so in the end, the buckets that dominate and drive female sinfulness are the disordered desires that take place when we compare and the disordered desires that take place when we believe we have to be perfect. Those two enslave and brutalize the feminine soul and take what is lovely and make it reek of death. Now, just in closing here, uh, all of humanity, male and female, um, struggles with this. Whatever desire controls our heart will control our life. Whatever controls us is our Lord. The person who seeks power is controlled by power. The person who seeks acceptance is controlled by the people he or she wants to please. We do not control ourselves. We are controlled by the Lord of our lives. So what is your Lord? What is controlling you. The most devastating reality is that what we lust after ends up dominating us, enslaving us, having dominion over us. Thomas Chalmers wrote an article called The Expulsive Power of New Affection. And in that article, here's what he argues. I tweeted it out earlier today, so you can go uh, look it up if you're on the Twitter. I like to call it the Twitter. So if you're on that, you can find this article that I'm reading. The Expulsive Power of New Affection says, where desires are distorted and broken, the only thing that can drive out desire is new desires that have more power than old desires. So if only we could have a new desire placed in our heart that has more power than comparison and has more power than perfection. But that's next week's sermon. And spoiler alert, it's Jesus. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, I pray now for my sisters. Father, where they are overwhelmed and owned by comparison. Will you enter that space and bring peace? Father, for those who are obsessing about their bodies, obsessing about their looks, obsessing about their clothes, obsessing about how they are seen and viewed and judged, will you enter that chaos, that high-winded, crazy-waved storm and whisper peace? Bring a soothing to that soul for my sisters stuck in perfectionism, this disordered desire for a righteousness of their own where anxiety and depression and fear rule their lives for being found out that they are not all they're showing themselves to be. I pray for rest today. I thank you that you are our perfection. You are our righteousness. And so we might in your righteousness, begin to day at a time walk faithfully in our failures, confessing, repenting, and moving forward the best we can by your grace in the community of the saints. Father, for men in this room who prey on insecure women with wounded hearts, Father, I, I just pray over these men a, a type of weight on their souls that would be crushing Father, I thank you that you do not take lightly wolves hunting down your daughters and that there will be a day that these men, hollow-chested boys in grown-up bodies, 
will cry out as you come for mountains to fall on them, but the mountains will flee before your coming. And I thank you that you are a just judge who will not handle lightly boys who can shave, who take advantage of your daughters. And so I pray that there might be repentance for these men, for the salvation of their own soul. Enter these spaces. They're complex and hard. Pray for my sisters. Help us. Imprisoned in so many ways. I thank you that you are the author of what is beautiful. You are the one who stands outside of culture and outside of time and says, this is right, this is good, this is lovely, this is beautiful. Pray we not be enslaved to cultural norms that are so out of step with reality that if we could think objectively, they would look absurd. Help, we need you. It's for your beautiful name I pray, amen.